we need to balance the user control with people just getting to use the thing they want to use. Um, and I think the, the biggest mistake we've done as technologists that care about privacy and security is we're so obsessed with every little detail that we overcomplicate it for most people. And either you're building an educational tool or you're building a product. And I think we need to realize that there's, there's an important difference on how you design them Hello everyone, I am Sergio Maldonado and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy and technology with a clear goal in mind which is redefining the relationship between people, brands and publishers around transparency and control. Which is to say, we're aiming for real customer centricity or if you will, human centricity. It may take us 5 years, 10 years or more, but we're patient. We're enjoying the ride, pushing our ideas farther with every single one of our guests. Speaking of which, let's get on with the show. Okay, we have Andres Arrieta with us today. He is the Director of Consumer Privacy Engineering for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the EFF. He oversees projects and tech policy like blocking trackers. Andres is pushing for policy that improves privacy cybersecurity and competition issues. Let's hear what he has to say. Andres, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Okay, to warm up, Privacy Badger is your browser extension and I use it. Do you think people install it mostly because they are aligned with the EFF uh, principles and because they want to protect their privacy or would you say that a majority of people use your extension because of its ad blocking capabilities? Um, I think it's a little bit different for Privacy Badger than other ones, just because um, it's an EFF product. So we tend to attract certain types of people. That said, it's really interesting because we've done a lot of redesign in the extension because we realized that a lot of people actually didn't know it was backed by the EFF, even though like it says there in pretty large letters, you would think it's obvious, but a lot of people are, weren't even aware or didn't even know what EFF is. Um, and what we came to realize is even though we have a special set of users because of who we are, the majority of people are downloading these extensions either tracker blockers like ours or ad blockers yeah. uh, like other ones because they just tired of, uh, the ads and how much it impacts their browsing experience, how low, how slow it becomes the browser. Uh, if you're on mobile, how much data it consumes. Um, I think that's the majority of people, probably like a 70, 80% of our users. Yeah. How do you see the role of the EFF in the current browser war? So where we see that Chrome is coming up with the privacy sandbox and killing third party cookies, and we see what's been happening with Brave growing so much. And now the latest news on the global privacy control being adopted pretty widely. How do you see your role in that ecosystem? I think in many ways it's similar to <clears throat> what we had with Netscape before. And in other ways, it's very different. Um, uh, I think the reality is now almost everyone is using Chrome. Um, and when you look at the percentage that uh, you, of, of users for Firefox, it keeps going down, which is very, it's very weird because people are clearly angry about the state of privacy. This myth a couple of years ago that the big companies like Google and Facebook tried to push that privacy is dead. And we're almost convincing everyone. People have woken up and be in saying, no, it's not like I want my privacy back. But even then we keep seeing their numbers go down and you have to ask yourself, well, what's going on? Like clearly people want privacy, uh, but they're choosing the least private friendly browser. Uh, the one that is backed by a company that uh, makes their money by tracking everything you do, by not caring about your consent, uh, finding loopholes in laws or not caring about it. 
and then saying, oh, we're going to give you some privacy, but on the back end, they're really adding more tracking to their browser. It's the only browser that doesn't really do anything, anything significant about uh, trackers, right? And <clears throat> I think the main thing that we realized during the past couple of years at EFF is that the reason why the state of privacy is so, is so poor and bad in the internet is because of lack of competition. Uh, so that's, we've done a very large switch where a lot of us that worked a lot in privacy now work as well in antitrust and competition because we realize that we're not going to solve the privacy issue if we don't solve the competition issue. And we had discussions with the Department of Justice, with attorney generals, and this was one of the things that we were um, highlighting. And if you see their uh, investigation, uh, it says that now they measure the lack of privacy as a lack uh, of a competitive environment because there are no other options. And that was very exciting. Like the, I think we're in, in times that are really exciting for, our, for us, for our perspective, where we, we see why a lot of these issues that seemingly before weren't as clear, but now with the size of these companies, with all the investigations, we lost in Europe like GDPR passing and still having a lot of privacy issues, we realized it really is a competition issue. There is no competition in the internet and many of these companies will tell about, well, let me list all of the competitors and they're really not competitors, right? Like yeah. they're too small to compete. They play <clears throat> they play within what they're allowed to play so they can say there's other competitors. I think Mozilla still exists in large part because Google finds it. It's not just Mozilla, you can see, look at Safari. Um, and Safari, it, I did a lot of things I was expecting from Mozilla and Mozilla didn't do them until Safari actually did it, until Apple did it. And now you see the battle between Apple and Facebook and obviously Google trying to fight it more silently than Facebook. But the, the reality is that uh, is it's changing. So what we see now in the privacy wars, we were thinking, we wanted to see a war on privacy in the sense of they would fight to say, I'm the most private one. That's what we want them to fight about. Um, and we're still not seeing that. Chrome is releasing Manifest V3 and the Privacy Sandbox, which is, you know, I, I find it is the same name that uh, oil companies use for like green extraction of oil. Yes. In a way, it's like the ecosystem is not helping either. If Apple is sort of claiming to be pro-privacy and then they take so much money from Google every year to be the default search engine, they are themselves contributing to that element of convenience where Google is the default and therefore Chrome makes your life easier in that within that default choice. So, and, and to the other point on competition, I know you think about this, but... Something that's been happening, which I think it's dangerous for privacy, is that because competition is becoming more important, competition is often at odds with privacy, where in the UK recently, the, uh, the competition authority was questioning Google because of the privacy sandbox decision. <laughs> and so sort of saying that they are going to add another bottleneck to the ad tech market and that they need to be careful and perhaps not even kill third-party cookies so that they favor an open ecosystem, which itself is worse for privacy than a closed ecosystem. That's a pretty yeah. hard choice. Yeah, I think the problem that's happening is many regulators start to pay attention to the issue, but not because people were complaining about it. People have been complaining about it for a long time and many regulators or policymakers clearly did not care enough. Uh, and now they're caring because of, of the industry, the ad industry sending all their lobbyists uh, with all their money and saying, hey, like this is very anti-competitive. And I think one of the mistakes we've made, especially in Europe is starting tailor creating laws just for Google and Facebook. And I think that's a mistake. Of course, they're the biggest ones and we need to address them. I think we have to break them up. There's a lot of things we have to do about them, but saying like creating laws, just thinking of Facebook and implementing it widely is a mistake because not everyone is Facebook. And they have a very narrow view of how the internet works. So you will have what you just mentioned where they're like, well, 
yes, it's true that the privacy sandbox, Google killing third party cookies and applying the privacy sandbox is a competition issue because these will make it hard or almost impossible for anyone that does uh, behavioral targeting to compete against Google, while Google will have the upper hand because they own the browser that is installed in most computers, which uh, is going to be doing the tracking. That is correct. That is a competition issue. But rather than saying, oh, because of that, let's stop them from doing that and keep third party cookies, the thinking should be, well, maybe the whole issue is the behavioral advertisement industry. Like, it's not about saving an industry that is based on exploiting human right violations, but maybe this industry shouldn't exist. Um, an industry that exists based on violating human rights is not an industry that should exist in my opinion. It doesn't matter how much money they make, they're not providing anything to society of value. And many of the issues we've seen with uh, uh, the elections, the, all the election issues, uh, how divisive opinions have become come from behavioral targeting. Um, so they took, they started on the right path of that we have a competition issue, but they stopped to quickly run and walk in the rest of the path and saying, well, the, the issue is not Google, it's the industry at large. Yeah. How do you see the future of the browser ecosystem with the global privacy control gaining a lot of ground and Chrome killing third-party cookies? Uh, I, I think that Google has realized that third-party cookies are going away. I think they realized that a long time ago, but they tried to stay there for as long as they could. And I think the main thing that changed it is people becoming aware of the issue, which in, like pushed new laws like GDPR and CCPA and many others. Um, and then companies with power saying, okay, we're gonna make our business privacy. Apple is that. And like doing what they did with Safari, which was a big hit for the industry. Um, so with that happening, it just created the momentum, one thing after the other, after the other, that I think team at Google realized that uh, they, they need to get ahead of it. And they need to make sure that there's still, a, you know, the, the money maker in the future. And there's no money making for Google other than with some sort of behavioral advertisement, right? Like we've been, we've been wanting to see a world where we just have a contextual advertisement because then it puts everyone on, on a level play field. It's not about who gets to track more people, who gets to have more data. Anyone can compete. Uh, that doesn't work for Google. Otherwise, why would you go to Google, right? Um, <laughs> so I think this is why they started the privacy sandbox and maybe they actually believe it's private to a certain level. And I think, and I, I started to realize how much, how many people actually thought it was, in, or it was better than the status quo um, for many reasons, right? Like, I think there's a definition of privacy that is not, it's not that it has changed. I think like privacy has always been privacy, but what traditional has been thought of privacy um, is very limited. And I will get into that later. I think that another thing is that, well, let's just start with that one first. Uh, the thing about privacy is people usually think privacy is about, I control my data. Like my data is in my device, in my browser, my computer, my phone, and no one else gets to see it. And I think we saw that it was not necessarily so more in the crypto wars, uh, fighting for uh, encryption and not having backdoors and encryption, since that metadata says a lot about you. So I might not know the context, the, I might not know the actual content of the conversation, but if I know the context or the metadata, I know a lot about it. Same with your connection, why encryption on DNS is so important is like, I might not, through HTTPS, I might not see the content of the website, but if you see, go to suicideprevention.org or something like that, I kind of know what's going on, right? Um, and I think that's the same with privacy. What they're trying to sell you now, many of these solutions is that, don't worry, you keep your data. We actually don't see your data. We do analysis in your computer about your data and then we target you. And I would ask, is it really, still private because somehow they know something about you even if they don't have the data itself they know still how to target you so i would say that you still don't have privacy 
is it better than before? I mean, perhaps under certain scenarios, but still not private. It's less worse, but that we don't want a world that is less worse. We want a world that is better. And there's, I think, the question of sometimes when you give up, when you don't use your rights and when you don't protect them, when you give away your rights, we try to tell people you're not just giving away your rights, you're giving everyone else's rights because it gets it gets they get weaker, right? Like if we give away our privacy rights or freedom of speech rights or uh, for a fair trial, you're not just giving them away for yourself, you're giving them away for others, right? Um, hence why, like, just because you don't care about privacy doesn't mean that you shouldn't fight for privacy. Um, and I think there's a similar thing when we think of algorithms. And this is, I'm not sure here. I, I think it's, as you say, maybe philosophical, but I think it's worth thinking about it in where, well, let's say that I, I'm okay with all the behavioral tracking and uh, they keep all my data in my computer or my phone uh, and they create a model. And that's a model that they use on people similar to me without having all of the vast amounts of data they had on me. You might not opt in into that sort of tracking, into that, uh, into that creation of, of uh, a behavioral uh, footprint of yourself. They only have a little bit of data here and there, but that's enough for them to say, oh, this person fits in this model. So in some way, other people giving away their privacy have given away your privacy as well, because now they have a model about you. And I think it's a, it's a very good question. Um, and I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. I, I can see totally the, the, the benefits of some of these things uh, for medicine, for example, or, um, or, or for like actions you produce. But the question is, how is that data managed? How is it controlled? Who gets to look at it? And I don't have all the answers yet. I think it's, it's a very difficult problem because we kind of push as a society to thinking that privacy, the model was this one. And now we're starting to realize maybe it's not going far enough. Like it, it, maybe this is not even private as, we, as private as we thought. What do you think would be a next goal for software to play a role in getting people, not just to protect their privacy, but to take control and this time in the sense of agency over the data. Is there anything in sight for you? I think there's two things. Uh, for me, I really want regulators to finally clamp down on big tech. Um, and But beyond big tech, I would think they need to clamp down on the entire industry. There's a lot of small players that are really bad players. And uh, I want to see new browsers that I think one of the issues with browsers today is they try to do too much. And one of the things to Google's credit that made them so successful from the very beginning, just not on, like their search engine and their browser is was simplicity. They did things very simple. It was not bloated. You know, it, it's if you look at the steps it takes to start using Chrome from installing it, it's like that. You're just using it immediately. If you look at, at, at Firefox, you hear all these pop-ups about your privacy and this and this service and that service is great, but that's too much. And I think we need to go back to thinking in simple ways. And it's great to offer a lot of features. We try to offer that, you know, we talk about user control and that is great, but we need to balance the user control with people just getting to use the thing they want to use. Um, and I think that the, the biggest mistake we've done as technologists that care about privacy and security is we're so obsessed with every little detail that we overcomplicate it for most people. It doesn't mean we don't offer those options, but we have to start with a default that is really about privacy and security, but without like trying to lecture people about it. Uh, just make it be about, yeah, this should be the default. This is like, this should be the status quo. But the moment we start lecturing people, they already know many, and some of them know, but like, I think we've been approaching it from the wrong angle in terms of user experience and interfaces and how we address these issues and we try to explain them to the public. Um, and either you're building an educational tool or you're building a product. 
And I think we need to realize that there's there's an important difference on how you design them, um, depending on where you, which camp you are. What's the role that you see consent management platforms play there? Are they helping at all when it comes to cookie consent? I mean, the whole ecosystem, which is asking for consent and then depending on something like that. What's your vision? I think they're they're bound to fail to actually do something for the users. Their clients are not the users. Their clients are the websites uh, or the applications, right? And the websites don't want to be don't want to put a consent management platform that tells them, you know, 90% of the users did not consent and you only have 10%, which obviously impacts their bottom line because we still value behavioral advertisement rather than contextual. Um, so if, if you're a consent management platform that does it perfectly as we thought it was supposed to be, uh, I don't think they're gonna get a lot of business. I think that's a reality. So what we really have is a lot of consent management platforms that use dark patterns to fool people into consenting, which is not really consent if you were fooled, into tracking, right? Um, I've had discussions, I, I get often uh, emails from consent management platforms. It's, it's interesting how many of those I get uh, telling me, hey, Pricey Badger blocks us. Can you unblock us? I'm like, no, but we're a consent management platform. Like, I don't choose who, what we block. It's an, we have use uh, heuristics. Pricey Badger looks at things and it, it sees tracking for three times. It blocks it. So it means it probably saw tracking. Let me look at it. And indeed, they're saying tracking from the very beginning. They're like, well, we need to track who gives consent and who not doesn't. Like, no, 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 no. GDPR is very explicit. Uh, it says you need to track who gave consent. But if, if you just started, you don't have consent. The default is you don't have consent. You cannot set tracking IDs. You cannot set cookies if there is no consent by default, right? So within the privacy budget, everyone is missing something that I know I've put some effort into doing because I missed that, which is, if I know I'm gonna say no to everything, I will also say no to the bloody pop-up because it's driving me crazy and all I'm gonna do is say no by default. Do you have something like that in your roadmap? I think it depends on region because it's highly dependent on the law. Um, and let's compare CCPA in California which is a privacy law with GDPR. Um, in California, it's not like in Europe where you assume that the default is privacy and you have to opt in into tracking. In fact, you actually have to opt out. And I think that's a very bad thing in many ways, right? It says the default as tracking and that shouldn't be the default. That has a lot of implications with tools like do not sending signals like DNT, do not track or the global privacy control under different regimes. Under a regime like the one in California where the default is tracking, you need to send a signal to say, I, I actually telling you, you cannot track me, right? Like I, I'm explicitly telling you and asking you not to track me. Um, while in Europe, you technically don't need to do that because the default is that you're not supposed to track people. That said, there are initiatives in Europe about pushing for a similar signal like the NTN global privacy control to say, well, even if you thought, because you have the right to withdraw. Uh, so even if you thought, or for some reason, I mistakenly click on consent, I'm telling you via, via this automated signal that I actually I'm withdrawing my consent. So not only did you not have my consent, but in case I mistakenly gave it, or you thought that you got it, I'm telling you I'm withdrawing it, right? I find that shows the issue with consent and with enforcement. And the problem has been enforcement because if on, in Europe where the default is not tracking, people have to resort to these tools, clearly this is an issue uh, with how it has been enforced. So I want to see more tools of this implement. This is why we implemented global privacy control and privacy budget and whatever comes in Europe will probably implement as well. Um, but the problem keeps being whether companies are going to respect them and they are not going to respect them until uh, enforcement agencies force them or put the fear on them of the consequences of not respecting those signals. Um, and that's going to be the same battle that we have with DNT. Do not track had the issue. It was killed because uh, Microsoft 
implemented it and said, okay, we're going to put it automatically in Internet Explorer and send it. And this basically killed DNT, interestingly enough, because the industry at large said, well, this is not a meaningful opt-out, which I find it really funny because back then they were talking, well, it's not a meaningful opt-out, but now they have all these reasons why it's not a meaningful opt-in, right? Uh, well, it's like, it, it, they're just playing what is convenient for them. But I think this automated nature of just sending the signal like that in every browser might not necessarily be the best outcome. What we want is people to actually manually make the decision installing it via an extension like Price the Badger or something else. That's what we need. Andres, thank you very much. Any final thoughts or readings that you would recommend or books? I would highly recommend to read what's happening with the current uh, antitrust cases, both in Europe and in the US. Uh, I think they're very interesting and they're going to define a lot of the privacy landscape. That, that's where our privacy is, is going to be fought. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's all for today. Please find episode notes and links to our social channels and other feeds on mastersofprivacy.com. Please do not give us five stars on your favorite podcasting channel unless you believe there is no more room for improvement. Your candid feedback is probably more useful to us. Thank you.